Hello and welcome to the Avram Rosenzweig Show. My name is Avram Rosenzweig and I'm really, really happy to have you here today. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Um, and thank you for being part uh, of this mission, I would say, to make the world a better place. And anyone who has watched my show in the past knows that the essence of it is really to take a look at humankind and pat it on the back. It's to give it a great big hug, to recognize that over the last 6,000 years or two billion years, whatever you believe, that we have done quite quite a great job in terms of developing um, ourselves as human beings, technology, the world in which we live with. And I think we need to see that. I think we need to watch that. And I think we have to be conscious of that because the more we are, the more we're going to embrace uh, each other. In other words, it's like being in a family. When you see the positive aspects of your siblings, of your parents, you know, all, all those involved, there's peace amongst you. And that's what I'm trying to, to do here. So um, I've had very, very many guests who are highly inspirational. And I always ask my listeners, my viewers, to take away from the interviews and these individuals who I think so highly of um, their mission in life, what they have done in order to succeed and to make this world a better place. We're not here for a long time, but we can be here for a good time. And I'm asking you to do that today as well. Um, my guest today is Eric Rubin. How are you, Eric? I'm good, thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no, it's great to have you. And Eric is coming to us from uh, Israel, Tel Aviv. Uh, he and his lovely wife made Aliyah on October 15th of last year. So congratulations on that. Thanks. You know, it's the best decision we've made. And um, despite the times, we've never been happier. Yeah, I am so happy for you guys. So happy. The, the beauty of Eric and his life is that he has really concentrated on how to bring pre how to bring peace to the world more specifically to Israel and throughout this interview you're you're going to hear about some of the organizations that he has worked with and the programs that he has started up in order to bring Israeli Jews and Arabs and Bedouins etc together uh, very often in a forum that's international not just in Israel and his background, Eric, your background is just amazing. I have so much respect for what you have accomplished in life up till now. You're still a very young man, and you have done brilliant things through the NBA in America, uh, bringing the NBA basketballs to Israel and showing them how important it is to invest in Israel as a startup nation and many, many other things. So the first thing I want to do is give you a pat on the back and give you a great big hug and tell you, well done, well done. Thank you. I really appreciate it. I appreciate being on your show and, and giving your listeners a chance to hopefully inspire them uh, to do great and important and, and peaceful things. Yes, let's do that. Now, those of you who watch the show regularly know that uh, mostly I start off with um, sort of a glitzy intro, which people have told me, Alvaro, that's not really who you are. I said, I don't really care. I like the gold and the silver, you know, and uh, the lights, and uh, I, I'm very much of an entertainer, and I have been for many years, but we're not going to do that today. And the reason we're not going to do that today is Eric and I were talking before the show started about how important it is, just even for a few minutes, to remember those hostages who were found um, yesterday. Today is Sunday when we're recording this. And to remember them and to think about them and meditate on their lives and their families' lives and all of Israel and really, really hope for peace. Just just before we, we do that, I want to say a very short Kaddish. Um, living in Israel, Eric, when the news came out, wh what was that like? Uh, it, it was heartbreaking. And what made it even worse was that before it was officially released by the IDF for their families, um, there were people on social media channels um, leaking the information and it was just sickening for many of us here uh, not knowing if the hostage families uh, had been informed um, not knowing the circumstances of of what happened um and so i i think i mean i went to bed pretty late it was probably three o'clock in the morning and, and the official news hadn't come out yet and then i woke up in the middle of the night and i checked my phone and i had the messages and I was just sick. Uh, it was. It was. It, it. It was just heartbreaking. It. It really. Really is. 
you know, the uh, the individuals who were murdered, uh, their names are Hirsch Goldberg Poland, probably the highest profile hostage through the work of his parents. Ori Danino, Eden Yerushalmi, Almog Sarusi, Alexander Lobanov, and Carmel Gott. Now, you have a 29-year-old son, and he should be well till 120. I have an 18-year-old son. And you know something, when I got the news late last night and I was at a friend's place for dinner, I, I couldn't speak. And immediately my mind went to my son. And we live here in Toronto, Canada. And I'm thinking to myself, the bravery of Israelis, both to live in Israel, because it's not as easy. There's a lot of lachats. There's a lot of pressure. And then on top of that, to send your 18-year-old child off to war to fight on behalf of Israel and the Jewish people everywhere. That takes a lot of courage. Did you did you go through that as well? Did you think about your boy when you got the news? Yeah, I, I, I did. You know, um, there was a wide range of hostages, still is, you know, from, from Kafir Bibas, the youngest, to Holocaust survivors. Yes, yes. Um, but I think five of those uh, that were murdered yesterday uh, were at the Nova Music Festival site, which was mostly young kids, people that just wanted to listen music and 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 you know they cared about peace. This was it was just a music festival. It was a peace festival. Yes, you know. And today, you know, my son happens to be uh, at the U.S. Open in New York. Um, and I think about that. I think about the attempt uh, by ISIS uh, to blow up, uh, you know, a concert in Europe not too long ago, Taylor Swift, and what could happen in New York. Um, and, you know, here in Israel, we are on the front lines of the fight against uh, radical Islamic terror. Um, but it can happen in New York. Uh, it could happen in Toronto. It could happen anywhere around the world. Um, and knowing that these 20 something year olds were murdered and we've since learned, you know, uh, bullets, they were shot in the chest and, and, and had bullets put in the back of their head. Uh, I mean, it's barbaric. Um, and yeah, I, I think about my son a lot. He should be well, he should be well. Um, I'd like us just to take a moment, a meditative moment. I'm going to say uh, the Kaddish, and uh, if you want to join in, please do so at home. Um, or if you're not into that, then just find a meditative moment where you can think on and focus on the lives of these young people, because the youngest, I think, was 23, and the oldest was 40. Their lives were ahead of them. Think about peace. Think about our ability to come closer to it. And if you send out good energy, I'm sort of of the belief that that helps in its own way, be it through prayer or just meditation. So let, let's do that together for a moment. Amen. Amen. So you made Aliyah. Why, why did you do that? You know, I, uh, my first trip to Israel was in uh, 1986. I was in college, so I was uh, 18 years old, I think. Um, and well, I, as soon as I hit the ground, I, I felt differently. I, I, it, it's hard to explain, but I felt differently being here. And then I think probably the most influential, maybe spiritual moment I had here was sitting in Masada when I was 18, um, in the temple, the sun shining on me and, and listening to the speech 
that you know was given before the people there uh, committed suicide. And then it just really, it just hit me. It just hit me very profoundly at that moment. Um, and you know, I've I've been here several times since in the last few years, uh, many times, several times a year, uh, even. And I was engaged at the time. It was it was my fiance's first trip here. She's now my wife. And we weren't even here a few days. And she said something to me like, you really are different here. Like yeah, there, there, there's there's a, a happiness. There's a peacefulness, a calm. Um, you know, I lived 57 years in the United States. But when I think about it, this is the only place I felt like I was really home. It's, it, it's the place I belong. Um, and so it wasn't, you know, after, after that trip is my wife's first time here. And uh, we had always talked about, you know, like, where do, where do we want to retire? I'm like, well, we like New York, but we can't afford to retire there. We're not Florida people. We're not Arizona people. One day we were sitting on the couch like a married couple, you know, watching a football game. I'm on my iPad. She's on her phone. And she says, I know where I want to retire. And I'm like, hey, here comes Massachusetts or Maine or North Carolina. What's she going to say? You know, and she said, let's go retire in Israel. Yeah. And we had never discussed, you know, moving there or making Aliyah. Um, and then what started to happen was we finally just started saying, what do we want to wait till we retire for? Right. I mean, I, you know, I think unfortunately, Avram, we've read reached the age, and I'm sure you've been there too, you're there too, where we have friends that are dying, right? You know, I, I actually lost someone I had worked with. She was not even 45 and passed away of cancer last week. I'm sorry. Um, and we don't have to be that dramatic. You know, our, our hips go and our knees go and everything else. And we wanted to be able to come here while we could still really enjoy the land and being here and going hiking uh, and going, you know, paddle boarding and for a canoe ride and kayaking and exploring the country. Um, and the more we came, we just decided this, this is the right thing for us. Um, and so I, I think it was only probably in April where we decided to fill out the paperwork to make Aliyah. And we were scheduled to fly here October 30th and make uh, Aliyah October 31st. I want to uh, just do a little bit of housekeeping before we continue, because uh, more than just your ambassadorship to Maccabi World Union and many, many other sports entities, um, you, you know how important it is as someone who was involved in finance to get sponsorship for such shows. <laughs> it's key. So just if you'll if you'll uh, stay with me for a moment, the show is sponsored by the Professional Center, Toronto's premier co-working space at 120 Adelaide, where more is the standard. The industry leader since 1987, TPC offers private and team offices, fully equipped meeting rooms, collaborative workspaces, premium amenities, and exceptional hospitality. Book a day, a week, however long you need. Escape work uh, from home distractions, which we often have, and discover more privacy, more productivity, more community at TPC. For more information, visit theprofessionalcenter.com. And if you mention my name, A-V-R-U-M, Avram, uh, you'll get 10% off private offices and meeting rooms. W what was it like, uh, Eric, when you landed in Israel, knowing you weren't there for a visit with a bunch of other athletes or leaders, but you were there to stay? What, what was the feeling? Well, maybe to take a step back, because I mentioned that our intention was to make our Aliyah flight on, on um, October 30th. Um, it was October 12th and I was glued to the news and uh, my wife was working downstairs and I'm in my WhatsApp groups and uh, she came upstairs for a break and she said, is anything new? Uh, and I said, I, I just can't sit here anymore. I said, I need to go. And she said, okay, if you could get plane tickets, let's go. Um, so we hustled out of the house. I'll save you that story. And we landed in Israel on October 13th. Um, so that, that was six days after the war started. Um, we already had our apartment. So we, we came to our apartment. 
Um, and I don't think we were here a few hours before the uh, sirens went off and we had to go to uh, our safe room, our bomb shelter. Um, how did it feel? It felt like I was finally home. <laughs> you know, it felt, it felt home um, and it felt great and it felt meaningful. Uh, you, you know, um, so we, we spent the first couple of days here um, just walking up and down two of the main streets, Dizengoff and Ben Yehuda, handing out cash because back then the restaurants were feeding soldiers. Nobody was going out to eat, but you would, you know, everyone was packaging goods for soldiers. So we would do whatever we could uh, to try to make a difference uh, and help. Um, and I think because of when we came, we felt... Israeli as, as Israeli as you possibly could. I mean, this was going to be our life. And, you know, a lot of our family or pretty much all of our family are like, well, do you have to go today? Yeah. Um, you right. know, like, can't, can't you wait a month? Um, you know, and I have a lot of friends in Israel. And one of the reasons we flew here on October 12th was um, I, I couldn't understand as a Jew how it was fair for nine... Well, you know, all my Israeli friends, millions of, of our cousins were here in this war and we were just supposed to stay in the diaspora and watch. Um, you know, one of the things that I know that a lot of Jews around the world say is, you know, thank God for Israel and thank God for the IDF because there'll never be another Holocaust. But what about when Israel needs the rest of the world? What about when Israel needs Jews around the world? And um, so we felt it was important to come here and, and we stayed uh, for about a week and then we went back to the U.S. to get the rest of our stuff and our dog to make the final trip here. And, you know, you asked me about my son. I remember, you know, it was tough saying goodbye to him, but I do really believe that part of the reason we're here is so that my son can live hopefully in peace and safety in the US because if there's not an Israel, no Jew around the world will be safe. Mm -hmm. um, and so whatever we can do to make a difference here, we just want it to, to do. And so uh, it, it's a long answer to your question, but it feels fabulous to be here. We've never been happier. We feel like we're making a difference. And, and I tell people we've become Israeli because we wake up every day determined to live the best life we possibly can because none of us know what tomorrow is going to bring. And so we make the best of every single day we have on this earth. What's your connection to Israel? You like know, where, I was just, where does this emanate from? My grandparents. How so? You know, my grandfather, he was just a Zionist. You know, he... Um, he fought in World War, he lived in America, fought in World War II against the Nazis. Um, it was important for him uh, as a Jew uh, to fight against the Nazis. Uh, he was actually uh, sick uh, and received an honorable discharge. Um, but because uh, it was so important to fight, he actually went to Canada to join the Royal Canadian Army because he was determined you know, to fight against the Nazis. And we just grew up in a house where um, around the holidays, he was the leader of the family. And, you know, it was very interesting because um, both my, 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 both my parents were divorced and remarried. And so we had a lot of big families with, you know, full brothers and half brothers and step brothers and steps, you know, it was, it was one of those, you know, and I remember, one time, because I was probably the more observant of, of the grandkids, I was probably tattling on one of my brothers. And I said, you know, Grandpa, so-and-so is not fasting. Uh -huh. And he just, in only the way he could do, you know, he said to me, he's like, you know what, Eric? There's only two things in this family that are non-negotiable, okay? Sadaka and support for Israel. Everybody else could do whatever they want. But those are two things that everyone in this family has to believe in. And so it was, you know, from him, um, you know, from watching the miniseries, The Holocaust, 
um, and understanding where the birth of Israel or the rebirth of Israel came from. Um, that was so important uh, to me. Um, and just from that first trip, you know, here, when I felt differently. Did, did your friends, Jewish, non-Jewish, did they tell you you're nuts? They all did. <laughs> they, right. they, they, they all told me. I mean, and maybe I am. You know what? Some of my Israeli friends. It just know, could be that you friends, might be, yeah. <laughs> you, you, you might be a little bit sugar, Eric. Um, you, you know, because, I mean, who moves in the middle of a war? Yes. yes. Um, you, you know, and, um, but it, I, I, I did feel, look, look it, it, if we didn't move, then the terrorists won. They got what they wanted. They don't want us to live here. Okay. So I, I, I'm not a superhero. I'm not in the IDF. I don't have an assault rifle. But we could all find a way to fight for the country. And just being here is fighting for the country um, and supporting the economy and supporting our friends um, and, you know, making shiver calls, unfortunately, is supporting the country. Um, and so, uh, yeah, they, they all thought, you know, it was interesting though, because the one person who, who, who got it was my mom, you know, and she, she said to me, she's like, Eric, if I was single and I didn't have your kids, I would go too. That's what she said. That's what she said. Yeah. Now your mom, uh, God bless her. She's uh, 79 years old, Ellen, right? Yeah. And your father's 93, Alan. Yeah. What, what did your dad say? Uh, he, he's very, he always says he's very proud. He's very happy. Um, you know, I think he would, he wishes I would have waited a little, but he understood, you know, why I didn't. But I, I think one of the reasons my dad also really understands it, uh, is my dad served as a Marine during the Korean war. Mm -hmm. And it's not just that he served because a lot of people served, but they were drafted. My father enlisted. You know, uh, my father uh, drove an amphibious assault vehicle. So I think that he got that the same way he defended America against the communists, um, that I was going to defend our people against the terrorists. Um, so I think as a parent, it's, it's tough. Um, you don't want your, your children to go into harm's way. But when you look into yourself and you realize, you know what, maybe maybe my son's a lot like I am, yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's different. So my grandfather and father uh, are war heroes and I'm not a war hero, but um, it always did bother me uh, that I didn't serve. Yeah. You know, my grandfather and father served and I went to, you know, a nice college and the liberal arts university in upstate New York. And I lived a, a little bit of a spoiled life. Um, and it always bothered me that I didn't follow in their footsteps. And, and I'm not going to say that I did what they did, but I feel a little bit more complete um, being here and knowing that I'm serving. Do you get frightened at all? No. Not at all? It seems weird, but I don't. Um, and, and perhaps this is an answer that, that I use to justify it. But, you know, I lived most of my life, you know, in New York. Um, I lived after I got married, um, I, I lived with my wife outside of Baltimore, Maryland. And I think, um, you know, crime is a concern. There's mass shootings all over the United States. When you look at the rise of anti-Semitism uh, across the world and what uh, students at U.S. universities and colleges are going through now. What was it a few days ago, the first day of class, uh, two students at the university, you know, in Pittsburgh were assaulted. Um, so part of it was realizing that I am probably more likely to be a victim of a heinous crime in the U S than be struck by a rocket here. I mean, you know, thank, thank God we have the iron dome. We have the IDF, uh, we invest in, in bomb shelters and, and safe rooms. Um, but I was never afraid. And I think part of it is that. I'm, in a way, I'm finally fulfilled. I'm here. And like I said, I wake up every day to live the best life I possibly can. And 
only Hashem knows when my time is going to be up. And, and if it's up, it's up. And uh, I've been here 10 months. And at least I've been able to make a difference for those 10 months. So does Hashem play a role in all of this? Your God-fearing person? Yeah, you know, it, 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 it does. And it's interesting because um, one of my friends said something to me when I was here. Um, and he's, he's much more observant than I am. And I said to him something along the lines, like, I know I'm not that religious. And he said, Eric, what do you mean you're not that religious? Because I think I had just finished telling him that, I, I mean, our Aliyah process went as smooth as possible. I mean, everything just fell in place from, from the time it took from our application to when we were accepted to the support we got. Uh, Nefesh Benefesh is an amazing organization that, that helped us with our Aliyah. Um, everything went so smoothly. And I just kept saying to him, I feel blessed. Like I, I said to him, I feel that, you know, Hashem just wanted us to be here. And he said to me, he goes, Eric, you may not be observant, but you are religious. If you believe that Hashem watched over you, and, and help make this happen and that you belong here, then you're religious. You might not be as observant as I am, but you are religious. And so I never really thought about it like that. Uh, but now, now I do. I, I do believe it. Did you go to the Wailing Wall? Uh, I, I, many times. Like upon your arrival, have you been? Yes. What's that like for you? You know, I... I um, I cry every time I go, <laughs> whether I was living here or not. Why? Why do you cry? Uh, I think it's where I feel closest to my deceased family members. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's our home. You know, it's it's the most spiritual. It's the closest place you can get to the first temple and the second temple. I mean, we're we're there. We're, it, you know, it's also the place um, when you listen to those who say that we're colonizers. <laughs> Well, that we don't have a history here. How can you stand there and, and not realize that this is it's our homeland? Um, you know, I think more so than than anywhere else. Um, but but the first time I was there, you know, um, you know, you, it, it was more meaningful because usually when you go, you know, I won't tell what I pray for. I put in the notes, but usually you're praying for health and happiness and your kids and your parents and all that. All I could do was was thank Hashem for being here. I, I mean, that was the only prayer I could think of that first time I went after I was officially Israeli. Is your wife Sue spiritual in that way as well? Do you share that? Um, probably in a different way. You know, Avram, um, I have a very, very special wife. Um, Sue's not Jewish. My wife's not Jewish. Mm -hmm. Um, and yet it was her idea to move here. Mm -hmm. um, and so she feels, I think, it in a different way than, than I do because, you know, I, I'm Jewish. But she, she sees in a way um, when, when she walks around Jerusalem and perhaps is at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre or at the City of David. Uh, and, and say, if, if you're a believer in, in Jesus, how could you not recognize this as the homeland of the Jewish people? Jesus was Jewish. This is where he preached. Um, so she's very uh, bonded uh, spiritually to this place, but in a different way. I, 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 it, it has to be different, right? Does, it work, does that work well between you? works fabulous like how do fun. you how does she allow you for your jewish beliefs and ritual and you allow her for her christian rituals how does that work um you know i think that um especially since we've been here um she's been more into the jewish rituals mm -hmm. um and you know we we spend most of our time um observing shabbat which we didn't do in the United States. And when I say observe it, I mean, we're, yes, we watch TV and we cook. We're not like that, but we have Shabbat meals. Um, we go and sit and watch 
the sunset. We go to friends for Shabbats. We have people over for Shabbat. We really like the fact that on Saturdays here, the world kind of has not necessarily stopped, but that there's it's it's very familiar. Even in Tel Aviv, which is not as religious, let's say, as Jerusalem, there's no buses, right? There's no trains running most of the stores are closed, you know, and, and it's a, it's a day of family and peace and calm and introspection and retrospection. Um, and we both really, really enjoy it. Um, I get it. You know, like I, I never really understood it. You know, I grew up in the U S um, and now it's just really something we look forward to. I mean, Friday nights with family or friends uh, is is something we love, and then we love just being alone and enjoying peace on Saturday. Do you go to shul at all, synagogue? Not much. I mean, the the first time since we moved here will be for Rosh Hashanah. Yeah, are you looking forward to it? I am. I am. Where are you going? So I think what we're going to do is um, I've heard that there are the holidays. So we don't live very far from you know the largest park in Tel Aviv, Haryakon Park and that they have services in the park yep. um, and, and just thousands of people, you know, come in the park for an outdoor service. Um, and that's where I think we're going to go. I'm, I, I just think as opposed to just being in a shul, you know, with however many hundreds of people that'll be there to be outdoors with thousands of people for the oh, first yeah. time oh, celebrating yeah. the high holidays is where I want to be. Will you pray? Yes. You will pray. Absolutely. So you feel the words, you sense, they call it kavana, that, you know, that you have a sense of what you're saying, where you're praying to. Yeah. And, and, and it'll, I'm sure it'll be more meaningful this year than ever before, because I'll be here. It's going to be hard for me to pray without crying. Yeah. You're a bit of a crier, aren't you? I am. <laughs> yeah, I can tell. You know, I, a few years ago here in Toronto, I started uh, a synagogue of my own and I call it the Forest Synagogue. And basically what I do on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur is I take 25, 30 people deep into the forest, which is not far from my house. Um, and we pray. We sit on these huge rocks, which remind me of the rocks in Jacob's dream. And we talk about the holidays and we talk about repentance and forgiveness. And we do some of the classic prayers like Avinu Malkenu, which you can go on and, you know, shuckle back and forth for a long time. Um, and then at some point we all stand up. We grab a tree, like tree huggers, and everybody feels that energy, like you said, of being outside and having that sense of, I am part of this beautiful, beautiful planet. And it's so exquisite. So I'm very, very excited for you and Sue. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, thanks. I mean, that's, and, and that's how we like to also spend Shabbat as we go overlooking the Mediterranean Sea. There's a bit of a hill and we sit there with hundreds of people with a glass of wine, everyone brings wine or some food. And we just sit there and we, we welcome in the Sabbath together. We just watch the sun come down. It couldn't be more peaceful, very, very quiet. And it's a beautiful land. And we're so grateful to be here to, to, yeah. to, to watch. We literally watch the sun drop into the Mediterranean Sea. And we knew the Sabbath is here. I, I there's no better way. So would you say Sue is becoming more Jewish? I think she is. <laughs> you know what? The yeah, other funny yeah. part, the, the, there's a couple of funny stories. So first of all, I was trying to figure out if she had a Hebrew name, uh, what would it be? Um, and then I found out it would be Shoshana. Yeah. And I was like, it, because really Susan is a derivation of Shoshana. Um, but, you know, you mentioned some of the, the work I do and we'll get into it. But I, I do do a lot of work uh, involving the Abraham Accords. Um, and uh, every Friday, um, we join a pre-Shabbat Zoom for the Association of Gulf Jewish Communities. Mm -hmm. So UAE, Bahrain, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and then there's Jews from the U.S. and Canada and, and the U.K. and Israel all on the Zoom. And I would probably say once a month, uh, Sue lights the Shabbat candles mm -hmm. on, the, on the Zoom. And so, yeah, this, you know, and, and uh, I'm gluten-free. She makes me gluten-free challah. She made, uh, she made uh, gluten-free matzo balls while we were here. Um, so, yeah, she, she has. That's lovely. That's lovely. So a little bit about your background. Sometimes people accuse me of not getting into the essence of the uh, guest. 
quick enough, but I am absolutely fascinated by people's backgrounds. I have so many more questions for you about your grandfather, your great grandfather. But you know what? Let's dive into your uh, career in volunteerism. Uh, Eric is an experienced nonprofit and financial services executive and an active pro Israel advocate. Eric spent over 30 years of his career in financial services and the last several years focused on nonprofit work with a specific focus on combating anti Semitism and anti Zionism. He is a global ambassador for the Maccabi World Union and is the only second person in the history of that organization to have such a title. Uh, he's also currently uh, the executive director of Project Max. Are you still the ED of that? Yeah, Project Max is a big part of the work we're doing now in uh, sports. Okay. Which is a partnership between the Maccabi World Union and Satir that is creating a community that cares about sports and sports role in fighting racism, anti-Semitism, and intolerance. So you've taken a very specific road in terms of strengthening the Jewish people, fighting anti-Semitism and racism, racism, and one could argue just strengthening, strengthening our world in general. Would those be the objectives in pursuing that road, all of those? Or does it really lay in, listen, I just want to make the Jewish people stronger? I think we make the Jewish people stronger when we make the world stronger. Yeah. It's, right. Tikkun Olam isn't repairing Israel or repairing Jews. It's repairing the world. Right. That's what Tikkun Olam is about. And when we strengthen our own community, but we also help strengthen other communities, I think it's the best protection we have for us is building bridges between people. Um, and so, um, yes, obviously combating anti-Semitism is a very, very large part of what Project Max is all about. But we do that by also combating racism and intolerance and facing hatred together. And, and when you go through your work, working with Arabs and Bedouins and other individuals of other backgrounds, um, is though is your focus really on Israel as such? Like, I know that you've done work in Haifa, right? Bringing together individuals on the soccer field, right? And, and, and your theory is, and tell me if I'm correct, that when kids especially come together on a soccer field, they're not really interested in what your religion is or what your background is. This is what you said in an interview, but more so it's that they want to have fun. And they want to get along together, right? So you have a lot of exposure to all types of people, but you naturally sort of tend towards the Jewish side of things. Well, I think the answer has to be yes, uh, especially in today's environment with anti-Semitism, right? I mean, the, the latest statistics came out, and I think what uh, Jews are nine percent of the population of New York, but they were forty-four yeah. percent yes. of the hate crimes. So I. I I think it would be hypocritical of me to, to say that. But while I also say that, uh, while I'm not old enough to remember uh, what it was like during the civil rights movement, um, but parents and grandparents were actively involved and aunts and uncles, right? And, and growing up, knowing that um, the NAACP, right, was co-founded by Jews, or that during the civil rights movement, Jews were murdered for standing for the civil rights era and community and for blacks in America. Um, there was a very, very tight alignment between the African American and Jewish communities in the United States because of that. Mm -hmm. That has become somewhat fractured, or some people might say very fractured. You know, there's been a tremendous rise of anti Semitism in the black community, I would say definitely in the U.S. and perhaps all around the world. I'm not so sure how it happened, but I also refuse to accept that we can't bring people back together. And if African-Americans are willing to stand with Jews and Jews are willing to stand with African-Americans and we could combat hatred and we can strengthen both of our people. And when I say that, I don't just mean African-Americans and, and Jews, right? We, we could do the exact same thing uh, with members of the Muslim community or LGBTQ community or you name the community. We can combat hatred together, right? I mean, 
we know the saying, first they come for the Saturday people and then they come for the Sunday people, right? If, if, if the radical Islamists succeed in killing the Jews, do you think that they're going to let the Christians in Europe just say, okay, that we, we just came for the Jews? Of course not. You know, I, I mean, look, look at Hitler. Hitler didn't just care about the Jews. It was his first goal, but there would be no more gay people left in Europe if he had succeeded. There would be no more black people left in Europe if he had succeeded. We face a common enemy, right? So let's fight the enemy together, whoever that enemy is. Well, what is your strength? What is your gift, your talent to go into those communities? Like I know you've worked with NBA athletes and to express to them your Jewishness, your deep, deep devotion and love for Israel and maybe try to bring some of those skeptics over to a, a better understanding as to the what I believe is the goodness of our people. I think the Jewish people are a beautiful, beautiful uh, people, and we do wonderful things around the world. What, what strengths do you li- rely on to, to influence people that way? I think part of it is sincerity and honesty. Um, and I'll give you one example. You know, um, we started Project Max um, about the time that, uh, you know, Kyrie Irving and Kanye West were, were making anti-Semitic comments and postings. And many of my African-American friends, football players, basketball players, all stood up. Many of them stood up, posted videos, made social media postings about how that wasn't right. What happened not long afterwards was perhaps the greatest football slash soccer match of all time in Qatar right? When the men's French national team lost to Argentina. And the next day, what happened was the men's French soccer team faced a tremendous amount of racism. I think everyone on the pitch was black. And so they were blamed for losing because they were black. We spoke up as Jews. We spoke up as Israelis and condemned that racism. And what I think that showed was that this was not a one way street. Okay. It wasn't just asking people to speak up uh, against anti Semitism. It was that we would all come together and speak out against these kind of injustices. And I think once we did that, it also showed others that we were not just selfish and interested in ourselves, but that we were interested and sincere about making sure that we combat this hatred together. It's, it's the, also one of the reasons that Project Max, I think, is different than many other organizations. Um, if I, I don't know if I would be running an organization or if someone came to because Project Max is, is only about two years old. If, if someone came to me and said, Eric, you know, we're going to have another organization that combats anti-Semitism. I would say, why? <laughs> you know how many organizations we have that combat anti And I'm talking about amazing ones like Stand With Us or the Combat anti I mean, combat anti-Semitism movement. There are many, many, many great organizations, Jewish organizations that combat anti-Semitism. We don't need another one that's just Jews talking to Jews and screaming to the world about combating anti-Semitism. We we have to do things a little bit differently, I think. I agree with you. I agree with you. Absolutely. Now, one of the things that really jumped out at me uh, when I was researching your, your life and the work that you've done is that you actually took, uh, I think it was 27 uh, individuals to Poland, to Auschwitz, and uh, many of them were Arabs. And you said that at some point uh, during your time there, that there were actually prayers and speeches that were said in Arabic. And I I think that's going to blow people away because most people don't know about that. But what an amazing experience that must have been. Yeah, so I have to tell you, I have a very dear friend here in Israel. His name is Yusuf Haddad. Um, He is a Arab Israeli, and uh, he started an organization in Israel called Together Vouch for Each Other, which I fell in love with. My wife and I started a a U.S. version of it. I serve on the board with with Yosef and his his um, his fiance Emily Schrader. And Yosef had told me that he wanted to bring 27 Arab Israelis to Auschwitz. Um, and so we went, we didn't just do Auschwitz, you know, we went to Oscar Schindler's factory so that we can tell the story about how you could be a righteous person and not have to be 
a Jew to speak out against the Holocaust and you need to do the right things. Um, and what we also did, that we, we, we did do the March of the Living, but the day before the March of the Living, we took the delegation to Auschwitz, Auschwitz and we held um, the, for the first time ever a Holocaust uh, memorial ceremony in Arabic on Auschwitz's grounds. Wow. Um, it was unbelievably moving for the entire group. Um, and to see um, most of the Arab men and women crying on the grounds of Auschwitz, you know, th there's a lot of really special uh, memories I have from that trip. But one of them in particular was, I remember I was standing, you know, in front of the gate, uh, the gate to Auschwitz, um, holding my Israeli flag. And all of a sudden, I started seeing someone come to me. And it was one of the, the Arab members of the delegation, a friend of mine, um, who wanted to stand there and hold the flag with me. And as I looked, I noticed a line of Arab Israelis waiting to take their turn to stand with me to hold the Israeli flag. That meant a lot. And I don't think that the world knows enough about the Arab Israelis that are proud Israelis that fight in the IDF for this country like Yosef did. Um, and he's not the only one, many of them did. Um, and unfortunately there's not enough Holocaust education even here in Israel for the Arab communities. And so when, whether they're Christian, Muslims, Druze, Bedouins, we can bring them, educate them. That's how we make a difference because I, I'm not so sure any of them really understood why, let's say, Israel was so important to a Jew if you haven't really been to, to Auschwitz and stayed on those grounds and done the March of the Living. Um, and I think it was, um, it, it really brought people together. I think one of my other favorite moments uh of that trip was we were waiting to do the march of the living we're, you know there's holding areas there you know you got people from great britain and australia and all over the u.s and israel and we're waiting for our canada yeah. canada we're waiting mm -hmm. for our time to march and the group from the uk is is singing you know a, a song shalom about peace and it's in hebrew and yosef starts singing salam in arabic and then we're going back and forth, Hebrew, Arabic, Hebrew, Arabic, Hebrew, Arabic, and all people coming together, you know, and um, just to see the unity that existed um, was beautiful. And I think that a lot of your listeners, as you rightly said, would not believe that something like that is possible, but it's possible. But it's also why this work is so important. It's, it's so imp why organizations like Together Vouch for Each Other are so important. I mean, you mentioned this, but one of the other things, so that was, we did the March of Living, then the following year, we took 20 Arab Israelis to Abu Dhabi on International Holocaust Remembrance Day and held a ceremony with our Emirati cousins hmm. and members of the Jewish community and 20 Arab Israelis to remember International Holocaust Remembrance Day. And we lit six candles. Uh, and I think I was the only Jew that, lit a candle, the others were Arab Israelis uh, or or our friends from the Emirates. Has your relationship with those 27 Arab Israelis or other Arab Israelis changed at all since October 7th? No. No. Um, all of them understand that this was an attack on Israel, not just an attack on Jews. Um, they know that Arabs were murdered, that Muslims were murdered, that Christians were murdered, that Bedouins were murdered. Uh, you just saw this past week uh, that, thank God, the IDF was able to rescue a Bedouin. Um, and when you hear the stories of what he went through, they didn't care that he spoke Arabic or that he was a Bedouin. They only cared that he was Israeli. Um, and so I would say that not only has it not change. And I think some people might have thought perhaps a negative way, but if anything, I think it strengthened our, our relationship because we realized we're fighting a common enemy. 
You, you realize that your experience is somewhat of an anomaly. I've spoken to many of my colleagues who dealt with, you know, Muslim Jewish relations. And they essentially told me this is here in Canada. And they essentially told me that when October 7th happened and they reached out to them, a lot of them are rabbis whom I'm speaking of. They did not get calls back. No, look, I, I've, I've heard that. I know it's true. You know, I still have all of my family. Although my wife is, is in the U S um, and we've seen what's, what's going on. Um, but what I could also tell you is there are certain uh, Muslims throughout the moderate Arab world um, who are some of Israel's fiercest defenders and are some of the fiercest critics of radical Islam. Um, and I think it really does depend um, where the Muslims originally come from, what country. I mean, it, 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 you're not seeing students from the UAE rioting on college campuses. You're not. Um, and so it's it's been very, very different um, in the U.S., Canada, much different in Europe, very, very dangerous in Europe. Um, but in Israel, um, and I'm not going to say, oh, look, I'm sure there's some uh, where it's changed for a negative way, but for the most part, I think it's brought them together. And I think that for the moderate Arab nations that are part of the Abraham Accords, um, they know that we're fighting a common enemy uh, in Iran and Qatar. So when you when you develop a, a vision, a target for a demographic of individuals whom you want to reach out to and uh, share the beauty of Israel with them, is it big enough? Is there a big enough group that you can reach out to? I mean, you took twenty seven, Kolakavod, beautiful. Um, but would there be any problem in subsequent years finding fifty seven or hundred and seven? Are they are those individuals there for you to interact with? Yeah, I mean, I'll be very honest. You know, you made a plug for your sponsors. It's all about funding. Our limitations are funding. And what I would say is that, let's take a step back when you asked about the target. I think that whether we're talking about members of the uh, Muslim community from, from other nations, whether we're talking about Arab Israelis, or we're talking about African-Americans or non-Jews in the United States, the way I approached all of this, and I don't know what the exact number is, but there's probably 15 to 20 percent that no matter what we say or do, they will never like us. They'll never want to come here. No matter what we say or show them, they won't believe. And there's a percentage, perhaps 15 or 20 percent, maybe a little bit more on the other side, that will love Jews and Israel with all their heart, no matter what happens, no matter what the government is, they will be supporters. Well, that leaves you, what, 70, 60 to 70 percent of a universe that at least has an open mind. Right. That's who I target in everything I do when it's if it's bringing an athlete here. Is it someone that's willing to learn and they have an open mind? If we're trying to take a delegation to learn about the Holocaust, are they willing to have an open mind? If we want to go to the UAE or to Bahrain, are they willing to have an open mind? Um, because what you see is there is no better education than being on the ground and meeting with people. You, you've been involved with various different sports in terms of bringing together Jews with Arabs um, and, and Bedouins and other, other, uh, other such people. One of them was through running, and you tell a wonderful story about Avi Solomon. He's an Ethiopian um, uh, Israeli, he's, uh, blind, he can't see, and he's an Orthodox Jew. Uh, tell us the story about when team Avi, tell us that story. It's a beautiful story. Yeah, it's, it's a beautiful story. And so much of the credit goes to a dear friend of mine, Justine's whirling. Um, and you know, Avi, um, always had a dream of, he was a marathon runner here in Israel, even though he was blind, he always had a dream of running uh in an arab country but because he only has an israeli passport he never could right 
And then the Abraham Accords happened. And Justine is just this woman that she doesn't care about herself. She loves making people's dreams come true. And so she decided to start raising funds and to build a team to help Avi run in the Abu Dhabi Marathon. Um, and I, I, I hadn't known her. I just following her on, on Twitter, uh, reached out, offered to help, um, and uh, began a fundraising campaign for her. And it was funny. She said to me, she's like, Eric, you should come. I said, Justine, be careful. If you invite me, I will show up. <laughs> um, and uh, we raised the funds to take you know uh, Avi there. And it was also very meaningful for me for a whole nother reason, because even though I was American and I could visit a, a, a Muslim country or an Arab country, I never had, because I remember when my grandfather was alive, I think I had asked him one time, had he ever been to the UAE or whatever country? And he said, no, until my Israeli cousins can go, I'm not gonna go. And I, I followed that. I, I just, why was I going to go to a nation that wouldn't allow half of our people to go to. Yes. Um, and so I, I went part, not just to help Avi and Justine, but, but for myself, for my grandfather. But it was amazing because Avi, Avi not only ran, but when we, we got to the race, you know, I think if you, whether it's a, a marathon or a bike marathon or something like that, you know, they usually will put the handicapped, the disabled people towards the back so that the the runners that are physically fit and healthy can go off and run and, and compete to win the race. And Avi got there and they put him towards the back and Avi said, I'm blind, but I can run. And sure enough, they moved him to the front of the line. Um, and, you know, he was tethered to a partner that he runs with and another Ethiopian Jew who serves in the IDF. Um, and they both were wearing, you know, Israel on their backs. Um, and it was an unbelievable, amazing race. I think that out of 12,000 people, Avi and his partner, Lior, came in 62nd and 63rd mm -hmm. out of, out of um, 12,000 people. Um, and it was so moving to be there. Um, I ran a 5K. Yes. I ran and walked a, a 5K. Yeah, good for you. Uh, <laughs> and and I you know I I crossed the finish line with an Israeli flag in my hand even though I wasn't Israeli at the time, but I have to tell you being there where friends Emirati friends that I had made through social media came to the race to support us Muslim Emiratis came to the race to support us I will never forget that they hosted us in their house um, we were there over Thanksgiving they held a Thanksgiving dinner uh, in, in my honor and, and all the Israelis came. Um, we, we did Shabbat dinner together there. Uh, it was a really, really special trip, but even waiting for the race to kick off, people from Morocco would come up to us and give us a hug and say, we're so glad that there's, there's finally peace, you know, between our nations. And there's pictures of me with Muslims from all around the, uh, the world saying, we're glad you're here. And, you know, let's just be cousins and be happy together. And, you know, that, that was a sporting event, right? We talk about the power of sports to unite people. That was a sporting event. It was a marathon in Abu Dhabi. It's phenomenal what you do, Eric. It's really special. I ask many of my guests, especially since October 7th, why the Jewish people are hated so much. But I'm going to flip it around for you because of what you do. When they embrace you in the Emirates or other places, at Auschwitz with Arab Israelis. What is it about the Jewish people that they embrace? What is it about us that they actually love? They love our spirit going back to Tikkun Olam of just wanting to make the world a better place. Mm -hmm. Look, I real, I, I'm not saying that there are not bad Jews or bigoted Jews. Okay, that, that's, we all know there's bad people. We've met no them. matter where you are, but in general, right? In general, as a society, like I said to you, what there were two things in my family that were non-negotiable. One of them was tzedakah. We give. We're taught to give. We're taught to make the world a better place. We're taught to support people, and I think 
it emanates from us. People can sense it. When you really get to know us, that's what we are about. We don't care about your color. We don't care about your religion. We don't care about anything, but are you a good person? <laughs> and do you have love in your heart? And I think that, that that's what people care about. I mean, you know, it, it's interesting. I think, um, and, and, and hopefully more people believe this, but especially since I've been here, it's not uncommon, whether it's a man or a woman, when I'm talking to a friend, for us each to tell each other, I love you. You know, and, and I sit there sometimes, I think about, imagine if I was 45 living in New York and I was talking to one of my male friends I and we you. ended every conversation with, I love you. Yeah. But we do. And there's nothing wrong with saying it. Um, you know, Yosef tells me all the time he loves me and I tell Yosef all the time I love him. You say it in Hebrew? What? You say it in Hebrew? <laughs> well, I usually say it in English. I speak very little Hebrew. Yosef speaks Arabic, Hebrew, and English. So. But no Yiddish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, all right. So let, let me take the, the next step here. I, I have to ask you then. It's your, answer, your answer as to what they embrace is very special. And I, I tend to think that if, if you, as you do, that if you would only hang out with Jews, you would see the fabric of the Jewish people, which is very intent upon, you're right, repairing the world, making it better. Not every Jew agreed. But at the essence of our people, it's the idea of a haftal rechet kamocha. You should love your brother and sister. You love yourself. Why are we so hated, though? Let me ask you that. I think it's jealousy. I, 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 I think that, um, you know, when, you, when I come back to how I told you, like, you know, I really live in Israeli now, that I wake up every day determined to live the best day of my life and be happy and make a difference. I think that that, that just really pisses a lot of people off. You think so? And I, I think it does. I, I, it's very sad to say this, but I think some people just love to be miserable or see others be miserable. And I think being joyous and celebrating life and not accepting to defeat um, is just something that really just really pisses people off. I, I, you know, I just, I don't know. I met you through Amer Gisin and Amer used to be the Consul General of Israel to Toronto. And I fell in love with him. <laughs> He is a very, very, uh, he's got, he's great visionary. He's very advanced in his thinking, thinking. And uh, he really took a different road here in Toronto and Canada in terms of where he wanted to take the Jewish people. He wanted to introduce us to the rest of the world in a very positive light. light. And he did a great job of it. Unfortunately, he's a bit disappointed as to where our city and our country has gone since then. But that being said, he is now the uh, CEO of Maccabi World Union, and you are the ambassador of that, only the second in history uh, of the organization, which is about 120 years old. Um, Maccabi World Union is involved in, it promotes Jewish identity, uh, the Maccabi Games, which essentially it's the biggest uh, sports entity after the Olympics in the world. It's enormous, regional and national, involved with regional and national federations, focus on youth development and so on. It's a big task, and especially when you work with Amir, who's such a beautiful guy. I can only imagine that when you were asked to be an ambassador, you must have thought it through a little bit because you knew that they have a very, very big uh, agenda. Why did you decide to accept that ambassadorship? So I have to tell you, it did take me long to accept, yeah. and it's because of the description you gave to Amir. I, I think Amir and I... Um, I know Amir and I think a lot alike, and he sees the world differently in visions. And I think he's taking a different approach uh, that's been done in the past at the Maccabi World Union. And especially now, um, because of how I think we see sports as being a, a, a bridge to the world, um, and that um, it helps also increase Jewish pride um, which I think he and I are also very aligned with. And at the time that I became a global ambassador, um, you know, we, we, we already had uh, October 7th. He, he asked me one after I had made Aliyah. 
And another reason that this was so important to me is, as you did mention rightly, the, the Maccabea Games are the second largest sporting event in the world. Um, we really want to try to make it the largest because in 2025 of July, after what we've been through as a country, Israel here, what the Jewish people have been through around the world with the rise of anti-Semitism, I don't know if there will have ever been a more important Maccabee Games than the one we're going to have in July of 2025. Imagine Jews from Canada, the United States, throughout Europe, Latin America, Israel, Asia, coming together to celebrate life, which we love to do, to do it through sports, um, and to send a message that we're, we're here to stay and we're proud. Um, and so for everything I'm passionate about and for the passion that Amir exudes, you know, that it was, it was just a perfect match and, and I'm honored to be part of the team and I hope I can help, you know, make it a, a big success. He's a very intense man, isn't he? He is. He's very intense. But in a, in a very positive way. Oh, he's a sweet man. If you hear the interview, that I did with Amir, which I know that you did, he was so incredibly open about his father. His father was a truck driver, I believe. And at some point in time, he got cancer and he had to wear a colostomy bag. And Amir told the story during the interview about how normally people who wear such a bag um, do not go outside because it can break. And he said, these are his words. He said, it can be smelly, you know? And that's Israelis. They're dugri. They're very straight, right? He said, but my father went out there and he lived life. And therefore, he was asked at some point to lead, to become president, if you will, of a patient's union. In Israel, they have a patient's unit, union. They don't have that here. Mm -hmm. And he said, my father became much more famous than I did. And I think Amir is probably being humble. But the thing that I love about Amir, it's his intensity, it's his openness, and his, it's his willingness just to take so many steps to achieve his goals, which is the strengthening of the Jewish people. And you could argue with Amir, it's the strengthening of the world as well. He doesn't just stop with us, right? Would you, would you agree with all that? I, I would absolutely agree. And I, I'll tell you something else that I don't know if all of your listeners know about the, the Maccabee Games, which is, yes, it is known as the Jewish Olympics and Jews around, from all around the world come to compete. But the Israeli team is not just Jewish. Mm -hmm. Any Israeli can compete. So mm -hmm. Team Israel has Christians and Muslims and Bedouins and everyone else playing for the state of Israel in a way against Jews from around the world. I mean, how, how bizarre is, is that? You would think, okay, it's the, it's the Jewish nation. It would be an all Jewish team, but it's not. Um, and I think it's, it's what Israel is all about. Well, what aspect of your ambassadorship do you enjoy the most? Uh, speaking, speaking about um, how we can use sports to combat anti-Semitism. Um, you know, I, I got to, um, uh, I gave a speech in uh, Gillette Stadium, you know, the home of the New England Patriots, um, about combating anti-Semitism through sports. Uh, I flew to Amsterdam uh, and spoke to uh, the European Jewish Association about the role that sports can play in combating anti-Semitism. And for all the reasons we spoke about before, about sports being a unifying agent, we need to use sports uh, to combat anti-Semitism. So this gives me an opportunity um, to speak about the role that we could all take on the pitch, on the court, on the field, uh, in the rink, um, you know, to, to try and combat this, this hatred, this racism. Are, are you still at all in awe of such speeches and the venue that you spoke at or the, the NBA players that you work with. I mean, is there any of that still inside of you at, uh, oh, you're 55 now, right? I'm I wish I'm 57. I'll be 58 okay. in a few weeks. All right. Well, muzzle tough on turning 58. <laughs> but are, do you ever look around? I know I've done this. I started in a nonprofit and we would have these huge galas and I would look around and Mia Farrell was there and I would look around and really, I'm just like a little guy from Kitchener, Ontario which is a small city about an hour west from here. And I would think to myself, my God, look at where I'm at here. Do, does that, does that occur to you still? It, you know what? It, 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 it happens a lot. You know, um, I spoke at the United Nations on the role that sports can have in bringing the Abraham Accord mm -hmm. countries together. 
Um, I got to speak in the Knesset uh, on the anniversary of the Abraham Accords, things that I never, you know, could imagine uh, that I would be doing. But also, you know, like a very emotional and moving thing for me was we had um, both Michael Sweetney and Eddie Curry here in the last few weeks, you know, uh, former NBA players. Um, and both of them met with the families of hostages. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael Sweetney, through a campaign we started uh, at, the, at the Maccabi World Union and, and Project Max, um, where professional athletes would adopt a hostage and lend their name. So Michael Sweetney uh, met with the family of Or Levy, uh, Or Levy's brother, Michael. I, I, uh, interview, and, I interviewed Michael, by the way. Yeah, and, and I also, um, Eddie Curry adopted Kafir Beavis. Um, and we met with the Beavis family. And even in those moments, I just, I sat there and I'm, I, I, I said, I don't know how I made this happen, but I'm glad I was able to make it happen because we need to keep the focus on the hostages and their families. Um, and, you know, something else, even besides the meeting and the emotional aspects of, of spending time with the hostage family, um, we also went out for dinner. Um, and they all loved basketball and being able to sit there with a former NBA player and guys that have won championships and to give them a few hours of normalcy in their life. Yes. Yes. You know, I, I remember saying to Michael Levy, uh, Michael, I don't, you know, I, I know I can't bring your brother home. I can't even imagine what you've been through, but I, I hope that maybe just for dinner, I was able to give you, you know, a little bit of normalcy. And, and Michael said to me, Eric, I, this is the best night I've had since October 7th. So is that what you. he said, really? Yeah. I, I mean, did you start to cry? You, you said I'm a crier, but you st like, how do you, when you ask me, you know, how do you feel? And do you ever, I sit there and I go, how did, how did I do this? You know, how, how, did, how, did, how did I get to this spot? And you, then what I say to myself is it doesn't matter. It just matters that you're here and you're doing it. And the same way we started, do I believe that Hashem had a plan? He did, and that's what motivates me. What was it like when you spoke at the UN? What was it like for you? You know what? It it was really amazing because I spoke with um, there were some U.S. congressmen there, um, but also more importantly, there were um, members from the Abraham Accord countries. The the Iman of Peace was there. I mean, it felt good to be there and to be able to talk about something specific that. I did and what we can do um, because what, I think one of the unfortunate things of, of let's say the peace that Israel has with well, Jordan and, and Egypt is it, it's just an agreement, right? It's a piece of paper and there's no more war. And I think what we're seeing in the Abraham Accords is that while there are pieces of paper, the most important thing are the people to people relationships. You have to develop those. And again, coming back to what you had said about Haifa and, and Yosef and playing soccer there, or football as they call it, it's about being with people and getting to know people and playing sports together. And you know, now the NBA is playing exhibition games in the Emirates, and you know, we're flying there, we're spending time together, we're getting to know each other, we're sitting in the stands next to each other. That's how we change it. It's it's a person at a time getting to know someone that they always thought that was was their enemy or could be their enemy and building bridges. Um, and so speaking at the United Nations um, was meaningful, but you know, I started my speech at the Knesset saying, whoever, you know, I, I, to me, there was no thing more meaningful. I had made Aliyah, a Jew from New York, and here I am addressing the Knesset, which also included some senators and Congress people who had flown to celebrate the, I don't know how I got here, but, but Hashem had a plan. Let me ask you. Let me ask you a question. A lot of people who watch my show, just a cross section of society, um, find it very hard to grasp onto their gift. You know, to celebrate who their essence is and the talents that I would say that God gave them. You know, how is it that you kind of figured out how to get into your zone? What is your thinking all about that allowed you to sort of look at sports and say, yeah, this is a venue, this is a way, a road towards peace, and I'm going to dive right in and, and get as involved as I can. What have you learned over the years about pursuing your own personal gift? 
give give us some advice on that. You know, I, I it really started for me only about five years ago. Um, I was sitting in my apartment in New York. Um, it was right before COVID, um, and it's scary to say back then I was noticing the rise of anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism because look where we are today. And I'm sitting in my apartment and I'm saying, okay, you know, I've had a relatively successful financial services career. I've done some things, but what have I really, what have I really done? Okay. So you launch an ETF for a mutual fund or you help somebody save some money. What impact did I have on the world? What, what is my legacy? Right. Um, and I just said to myself, okay, like, how can you make a difference? And it was very frustrating in the beginning because when you're 52 years old, right? And you start applying for jobs in a field you've never had a job before, you get the questions like, oh, well, do you have a master's degree in Jewish philosophy? Yeah. No. You know, do you have 15 years nonprofit experience? No, yeah. I've run billion, I've run billion dollar companies and a nonprofit is a business. I know how to run it, but it didn't matter. So I had to figure out what, what can I do? Um, what could I do differently? Where is the advantage or the leverage I have? Um, and I've always been passionate about sports. And one of the, the things in my financial services career that I was very blessed to do was um, I, uh, my firm was selected to start the 401k plan for the NBA. So I met a lot of NBA players. Um, I was hired to run the financial literacy program for several years for the league. And so I had this network of high profile athletes that had become friends of mine, most of whom were African-American, most of whom we shared the same values. And it was through those sports and those connections that I realized we're brothers, right? I mean, like one of my good friends is Eddie Johnson. I mean, I love him like a brother. OK, so what is it that Eddie believes that I believe and how can we partner together to make a difference? And it, it, it was a battle and a fight at first. And I think, you know, Hashem tests us um, because, look, there are frustrating moments. I don't know about you, but when I first really started getting involved, I don't know, I falsely had this vision that I would change millions of people's minds overnight or even in a week or a month. And I would have very little response. And, you know, the, it, it was discouraging. Yes. And I don't know. I just realized it literally is one person at a time. Mm -hmm. But if you can affect one person and that a person affects a person who affects a person, it's how a movement grows. So number one is you have to be persistent. Number two, I would say really evaluate what your own strengths really are, not what do you think they are. Where is your network? How can you use your network to do good? And then most importantly, perseverance. Don't get down. Don't get dejected. Keep forging ahead because it literally is one person at a time. Well, what would Sue say that she loves most about you? <laughs> Probably my sense of humor. Yeah? Do you have a good one? You know, I don't know if she would say it's good, but at least I have one. <laughs> at um, least you laugh, right? I think, I th look, I, we have to laugh. We have to laugh yeah. and we have to live. Um, you know, we have to make the, the, the most of every day. And I, you know, I'm blessed to have a, a extremely supportive wife. We have a great relationship, um, but we make each other laugh. And we're just very pleased and blessed to be here together, living life, living these experiences. Um, and, you know, look, she's my biggest, my biggest supporter. She works full time. She supports the family. What does she do? Um, uh, she's a, a, a financial services compliance consultant. <laughs> um, and, you know, there was a time about five years ago when I was looking to switch jobs. I had a couple of job offers and I said um, to her, which job do you think I should take? And she said, I don't think you should take any of them. And I was like, what? Like, I, I need a job. What am I going to do to support the family? And this is when we were getting ready to move in together. We were going to get married. She's like, Eric, I've paid for the house and I've paid for the car and I've supported myself for all these years. She goes, I can't do what you do. The Jewish world and Israel need you. 
you do what you do and use your strengths and don't worry about everything else. I'll take care of it. She sounds um, like an amazing woman. What, what do you she, love about her? Her, her belief in me. Yeah. Her kindness, her support. It's, it's unconditional. Have you had many people who have believed in you so much? No. Right. Other than my mother, right? Well, of course your mom. <laughs> of course my mother. But other than my mother, no. <laughs> of course your mother. <laughs> Maybe my grandmother too, but that's it. <laughs> Listen, the, I... Uh, the important women in my life. Good for you, man. Good for you. Sounds like you've you've made some really good decisions. Um, I've been playing around with AI a little bit, artificial intelligence. Are you into it at all? No. You, you got to well, try it. No, no. So, so here's the thing. So Saitir, one of the founders of, of Project Max, uh, is a company that's artificial intelligence. And part of our model is to use artificial intelligence for good. Um, and so there are many good things that you can do with AI. Um, unfortunately, like with a lot of things, there's a lot of bad things that AI is use, being used for. Um, and it's scary. It, it's, it scares me with all the bad that, that it could be done with it. So I have very mixed emotions um, because I'm afraid that right now more bad is being done than good. Okay. Well, that being said, let's do some good. <laughs> I asked uh, ChatGBT to print up, to write a poem, and I've been doing this on a few shows, to write a poem about um, how sports can be used uh, for good in the world. So listen to the poem, Eric, and tell me what you think, okay? In fields where echoes softly tread and stadiums with hope are fed, a ball is passed, the whistle blows, and unity in motion, in motion grows. Beneath the sky, both wide and free, the world's disputes a distant sea. As teams align in shared pursuit, their common goal is resolute. From distant lands and varied tones, in sweat and cheers, the discord stoned. The game becomes a bridge of grace where every player finds their place. A tackle made, a goal achieved, in triumph shared, old wounds are eased. The rivals smile, the embrace is warm, in sport we shed our old harm. When nations clasp, when tempests roar, the field becomes a tranquil shore, where rival hearts with courage beat and find in challenge friendship sweet. In every sport, in every play, the world's divide are swept away. For in the game, in every quest, the spirit of our peace finds rest. So let the tournaments unfold in every story that's retold. May sports embrace so vast and wide bring solace to the world outside. Right, you convinced me. Not bad, right? No, that was pretty good. You're going to have to send that to me. I will that send that excellent. to you. I will. Please, I will. please. But I wanted to uh, thank you very much for doing this. Um, I, I enjoyed being with you a lot. I, I'm always really deeply fascinated by meeting someone through an interview like you and I have never talked before. First and time. I just have so much hope for our people and for the world. Honestly, when I meet individuals like you, because your work is so beautiful, Eric, and I want to commend you for that. Like I said before, a big, big pat on the back. Keep doing what you're doing. Take good care of yourself. I know you said you're not a great basketball player, <laughs> <laughs> but stay out ask my friends understatement of the year <laughs> but stay out there on the court and really really make sure you're healthy because we really need you and uh i think that my goal is to inspire others and i think you've done a beautiful job of that so thank you very much i'm so grateful well thank you for having me thank you for sharing the story and not just mine but all the stories that uplift people and there's so much negativity in the world that, you know, God bless you for sharing the positive stories that uplift us and give us hope. We need a lot more of that. So really, thank you. Yes. Thank you so much for saying that. I appreciate it. And also thank you to my sponsor. <laughs> we are sponsored by the Professional Center. Now listen to this. Toronto's leading co-working space where excellence is the norm from private sunlit offices to fully equipped meeting rooms. Their spaces are designed to allow you to focus and to get to work. At TPC, they combine high-end amenities with unparalleled service, ensuring your office experience meets the highest standards. Discover why TPC offers more sophistication, more privacy, I like saying privacy, and more opportunities to grow. For more information, visit the professionalcenter.com. You'll see it right down uh, below my screen. And if you mention my name, Avrum, or as Amir calls me, Avrum, A-V-R-U-M, 
you get 10% off private offices and meeting rooms. You, you understand what this company does, right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. They rented like they at least a huge, huge, like a couple floors, and you can take a parcel of it, and you can use their administration and equipment. It, no, it's great. We've done some of that in the past. I mean, it's so much more cost effective. And especially when you're running your own small business and you don't want to worry about yeah. the lights and the, and, and, you know, the, the security and the copier machine or the printer, you know, the printing machine and having a secretary to greet people on the way in. It, it really makes a very, very professional um, space and appearance at a fraction of what the cost, but more importantly, you don't have to deal with the headache. And when you have your own small business, that is so important. No, oh, thank you so much. Nicely done. I'll have to tell the owner. I appreciate that a lot. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. And as I said before, please take away from this interview uh, ways and means that you can develop yourself, that you can inspire yourself. Do so through the really kind and wonderful and generosity spirit of Eric Rubin, um, who was my guest today. And through that, there's no question in my mind, we can just make this world a better place. Once again, we send out our love. Uh, we cry for the hostages and their family. Um, more specifically today, those six who were found dead, found murdered uh, only yesterday. And we wish to for the families that at some point in their lives again, that they should find shalom, that they should find peace of mind. Um, it's a very difficult time. And uh, yeah, we hope that for them. So until then, as they say in Yiddish, how do you say, how do you translate Zygazint, Eric? <laughs> do you not speak any Yiddish? A little bit. I don't, how do I, like there are some words you can't just translate. On. That's very true. Right? Means, be healthy, right? Be healthy. Be good, be good, be well, be yeah, be well, yeah, like our grandparents, well. right? Be well, be well, and we will we will see you soon. Um, and till then, be proud to be a Jew. Be very proud to be a Jew. I'm Yisrael Chai. I'm Yisrael Chai.